Hi everyone, my name is Mallory and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. I work with patients on dialysis and today I'm going to talk to you about the MNT, the medical nutrition therapy for end stage renal disease or ESRD. As with many disease states, this should be a very individualized process. So today I'm just going to talk about general recommendations when it comes to MNT for ESRD. First up, we are going to talk about protein. So all dialysis patients do have increased protein needs as protein is lost with dialysis. So in the hemodialysis or HD patient, we are shooting for about 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. And then in the peritoneal or PD dialysis patient, we are shooting for about 1.2 to 1.3 grams per kilogram of body weight. Albumin's a limited nutrition indicator, but it is routinely used in evaluating ESRD patients' nutrition status as well as overall health status. Hypoalbuminemia is multifactorial and it can be affected by things such as inflammation, infection, fluid status, comorbidities, etc. We do focus on getting high biological value protein, but due to uremia and taste changes, getting adequate protein can be a challenge for the dialysis patient. Next up is calorie and energy intake. So adequate energy intake is necessary so as to spare protein for tissue protein synthesis and to prevent the protein to be used um, to be metabolized for energy. In HD, we are shooting for about 30 to 35 kilocals per kilogram for individuals greater than or equal to 60 years of age and 35 kilocals per kilogram for individuals less than 60. It's pretty similar in PD, about 30 to 35 kilocals per kilogram for individuals greater than 60 and 35 kilocals per kilogram for individuals less than 60 years old. This should be including their dialysate solution. These equations should be based upon standard or adjusted body weight. Okay, next up we're going to talk about fluid and sodium. So the majority of patients on dialysis do need to limit sodium and fluid intake. Assessment of their blood pressure, edema, intradialytic weight gain, serum sodium, and as well as dietary intake should be regularly evaluated to make patient-specific salt and fluid recommendations. Restricting fluid without restricting salt is usually not recommended as salt is the main driver behind that thirst sensation, increased fluid gain, and hypertension. A two gram sodium diet and a 1500 milliliter fluid restriction is usually what's recommended for patients on HD. A two gram sodium is also recommended for PD, but they usually have not as restrictive fluid recommendations as they're receiving dialysis daily. In HD, the goal is to have a fluid gain of less than about 4% of your body weight in between your dialysis treatments. So the dietitian and the patient should work closely together to discuss how to manage thirst without drinking. All right, next up is potassium. Potassium is pretty significant in the ESRD population. Um, it affects muscle action and too much of it can cause the heart to stop. Potassium is found in many fruits and vegetables as well as dairy and beans. With a high serum potassium or the risk for one, usually sticking to 2,000 milligrams or less of potassium per day is considered safe. In PD, patients actually have higher potassium needs, usually around three to four grams, uh, but close monitoring of the patient's labs, their dialysate content, dietary intake is essential for both the PD and the HD patient. Okay, on to phosphorus. Phosphorus is retained as the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, decreases in the CKD patient. It's not easily removed on dialysis either. Phosphorus is found naturally in our protein foods as well as unnaturally in the form of phosphate additives in our processed foods. Naturally occurring phosphorus is only about 60% absorbed by the body, whereas phosphate additives are close to 100% absorbed. 
Phosphorus in the diet should be limited by both the PD and the HD patient. Usually around 800 to 1000 milligrams per day is recommended, but once again, this should be individualized. Dietary restriction alone is often not enough to keep phosphorus within goal. Thus, many patients do take phosphate binders. Binders bind to the dietary phosphate in the stomach and excrete it so that it does not get absorbed by the patient. With phosphorus, the goal should be to reach a balance between a quality diet that's high in protein, low in processed foods, and the correct dose of phosphate binders to keep serum phosphorus adequate. And lastly, we are going to talk about bone mineral management. So as the GFR decreases, the serum calcium levels decline due to the kidneys now are unable to convert that vitamin D to its active form. This in turn leads to poor GI absorption of calcium. The need for serum calcium also increases as serum phosphate levels increase. These causes can lead to hypertrophy of the parathyroid gland, which is responsible for calcium homeostasis. Chronic low calcium causes the parathyroid glands to continue producing PTH over and over um, and over time, this leads to secondary hyperparathyroidism and resulting severe bone disease. Calcium and phosphorus must be tightly controlled in the dialysis patient. Many will still experience hypocalcemia even when taking a calcium supplement. So the registered dietitian nutritionist in the dialysis setting plays a role in recommending medications including vitamin D analogs and calcium mimetics. The dietary balance of phosphorus, the use of phosphate binders and vitamin D analogs, the removal of phosphorus through dialysis, and close monitoring of lab values all contribute to bone management in ESRD. All right, in a nutshell, that's MNT for the ESRD patient. Thanks so much for watching.